In this video, you'll learn how code is developed and deployed. We'll explore the whole process from start to finish. Fasten your seatbelts. Okay, here we go. How do companies ship code to production? Okay, so the process starts with the product owner creating user stories. A user story is a description of a feature or improvement that will bring value to the end user. They're usually written from the perspective of the user, and they're used to capture the details of a requirement. They're often written in the form of, as a user, I want to... Yes, step two involves the developers picking up the user stories from the backlog. A backlog is a prioritized list of user stories, bugs, and other tasks that the developers need to work on. So they'll pick the user stories that are at the top of the backlog and put them into a sprint, which is a short time boxed period of time during which the developers work on completing the tasks in the sprint. Typically, this sprint is two weeks long, but it could be shorter or longer depending on the team's needs. Explain that tools like Jira and Azure DevOps are commonly used to manage the backlog, sprints, and the tasks within the sprint. They allow teams to track the progress of the work, and they provide a way to collaborate and communicate. Without these tools, it would be much harder to keep track of everything that's happening during the development process. Detail. The developers will use a version control system like Git to keep track of the changes to the code base. When they make changes to the code, they'll commit those changes to the Git repository, which is essentially a database that tracks all the changes. This allows them to keep track of what's been changed, and it also allows them to roll back to previous versions of the code if needed. So when the developers commit their changes to the Git repository, that will trigger a build in Jenkins. Jenkins is a tool that automates the process of building, testing, and deploying software. It will run the unit tests on the code, which are small tests that make sure the code is working correctly. It will also check the code coverage, which is a measure of how much of the code is being tested. And then Jenkins will check the code against the gates in SonarCube. SonarCube is a tool that analyzes the code for quality and security issues. It will check things like code complexity, duplication, comments, and other metrics. It will also check for any security vulnerabilities in the code. If the code passes all of these checks, then the build is considered successful. Otherwise, it will fail, and the developers will have to fix any issues before the build can be considered successful. So let's talk about step five. When the build is successful, Jenkins will store the build in a repository called Artifactory. Artifactory is essentially a storage place for all the builds of the software. Once it's stored in Artifactory, Jenkins can deploy the build to the dev environment, which is a testing environment that's separate from the production environment. The dev environment is used to test the build in a safe environment before it's deployed to production. Right, so step six is all about the different teams working on different features. Even though they're working on different features, all of those features need to be tested separately. That's where QA1 and QA2 come in. QA1 and QA2 are separate testing environments that are used for different teams. This is so that each team can test their features without interfering with the other teams. This helps to keep the testing process organized and efficient. In step seven, the QA team picks up the new QA environments and starts testing. They'll perform QA testing, which is where they'll test the features against the requirements to make sure they're working as expected. They'll also do regression testing, which is where they'll test the existing features to make sure the new features haven't broken them. And finally, they'll do performance testing, which is where they'll test the speed and responsiveness of the features. All of this helps to ensure that the features are working properly before they're deployed to production. Of step eight, once the QA builds pass the QA team's verification, they are deployed to the UAT environment. UAT stands for user acceptance testing. This is the last stage of testing before the features are deployed to production. During UAT, the QA team, dev team, and even the product owner test the features to make sure they meet the requirements and expectations of the users. This is the final opportunity to find any issues with the features before they're released to the users. So let's dive into step nine. In this step, if the UAT testing is successful, the builds become release candidates, which means they're ready to be deployed to production. However, to mitigate the risks of a new release, the team might not want to deploy the release to all the users at once. Instead, they might use techniques like feature toggles and canary deployments. Feature toggles allow the team to turn features on and off for different groups of users. In step 10, we're talking about the SRE team's responsibilities in production. Basically, the SRE team is responsible for monitoring the production environment and making sure everything is running smoothly. They use tools like Elk, Prometheus, and Skywalking to analyze logs and trace processes. If they find any issues, they report them to the QA and dev teams, who then work to fix the issues based on their priority.